All right, hello and welcome to the Expert Inside Interview. My name is John Gold from Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine, and Pipeliner CRM. And today I am delighted to be joined by Amy Edmondson, who is in Harvard University today. How are you doing, Amy? I'm doing very well, thank you. Yeah, and Amy is the Novartis Professor of Leadership and Management at the Harvard Business School, a chair established to support the study of human interactions that lead to the creation of successful enterprises that contribute to the betterment of society. And and that is an excellent, excellent uh, mission uh, to undertake. And Amy is uh, author of a number of books. She's done TED Talks. Um, so, you know, you can find a lot of... Uh, Amy out there if you want to uh, you know see some other stuff but what we wanted to talk today about was Amy's book teaming how organizations uh, how organizations learn uh, innovate and compete in a knowledge economy and and I think this is a sort of incredibly important subject because uh, I'm not sure I mean I think the natures of te- the nature of teams has evolved and changed because once upon a time, I think you'll agree, you maybe had a team leader who was more expert than everybody and you had different members of the team. But nowadays, everything is, the expertise is so particular and specific that you that nobody can be the expert in everything anymore. That's absolutely right. And so teams have gotten both more diverse in expertise and more fluid, meaning I think you're mm. teaming up with different people at different times you know, in the course of an ordinary work week. So it's it's no longer the case for most people that they have their team mm-hmm. that's reasonably well-bounded. They know everybody. They work well together. You know, they look to the to the team leader for the answers and 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 so on. Yeah, and I think uh, and I think part of that is, as I said, is everything has gotten so specialized that. Uh, number one, when you come to approach a, a project or a, or a business initiative, the chances are you don't have all the skill sets within your organization, nor do you need them on a full time basis. So now we have this mixture of teams of full time contractors, you know, as you said, very fluid. Yeah. And I think in, in many occupations, you're teaming with people from other organizations, too, mm-hmm. not just contractors, but say you're in sales in B2B sales you are teaming up with people from client organizations to figure out how your technology or your service or your offering is going to work best in their world. So as the nature of of teams evolves and as uh, organizations are kind of faced, I think a lot of times with with quite a big challenge, because here's an interesting phenomenon that I have seen. I've seen that there are companies up in Silicon Valley or wherever that have highly disruptive business models, right? But the minute they the minute they start to be successful, they build a very rigid, hierarchical, traditional form of business, which makes no sense. Uh, so to me, anyway. So yeah. how is it? So how do organizations need to evolve to be able to leverage teaming in a new and more fluid way? That's a big question, and you know, a complex. Phenomenon, complex question. But first, all you know, all small organizations are kind of naturally mm-hmm. fluid, agile, and and maybe even innovative in the sense that people are trying to figure out what works because otherwise they won't survive. And so they're mm-hmm. very scrappy, very curious, very able to find the people they need to team up with about particular things. And then, of course, as they succeed, they get bigger, and as they get bigger. Gets more, there are more people, and as there's more people, there's sort of a more of a need for formal processes and formal, you know, routines and reporting structures and rules and and all of that. And and part of that is a almost a necessary order on chaos. Um, and part of it, as you suggest, ends up kind of killing the very freedom and creativity that got us that got us where we are. So. Organizations, as they grow into what we call phase two, mm-hmm. have to be alert to, you know, leaders, managers have to be alert to the very the risks that they now encounter. You know, the risks of, of becoming stagnant or frozen, mm-hmm. or, you know, not not interesting. And then and so they have to inspire people to do a variety of things. One of the most important being to team, right? To team mm-hmm. up, to still reach out, and especially to reach out across their silos, you know, mm-hmm. to 
to kind of work with people because that's where innovation comes from. If we're not yeah. reaching out across silos, we're not innovating. And if we're not innovating, eventually even this beautiful success formula that we found starts to taper off. We become irrelevant. Some other company comes along with the with the new great model. So the trick is to be, you know, disciplined. You know, to have mm -hmm. the systems and processes you need for disciplined execution, while also having the culture, the creativity, the ability to team up for successful innovation. Yeah, because I mean, part of it now is there's a certain democratization of work, if you like, going on. You have sites like Upwork where you can find, you know, expertise in any part of the world in a way that you never could before. Right. So I think the other part then is and, and this is a challenge for organization is, as I said, to create teams that are a mixture of inside and outside people, but to do it in a way where you can all come together for a common goal, as opposed to what happens in a lot of organizations is it's an us and them. Oh, you know, those yes. people out there and us people in right. here. So. So, so trying to create an environment, as you said, a culture where they're able to bring together people from inside and outside. And that means really being um, excited about the other person or entity as a resource, not as an obstacle, yeah. not the competition, you know, not as someone who's, you know, I, I want to protect myself from, but someone who I'm willing to be vulnerable with. And, and I think that's a, a mindset issue, and it's, a, it's the same mindset issue that, you know, that, that great salespeople have, right? which, mm. is the, which is the mindset of curiosity and eagerness to help solve a problem as opposed right. to, you know, lack of curiosity and sort of self-centeredness and a desire to just get my stuff, my money, my needs, my time, whatever. And the other part is, I mean, I would say exactly if you're on the subject of sales is that more and more, particularly in B2B sales, I mean, we've seen the statistics, I think Gartner says there's an average of eight people involved in a buying decision or whatever. Um, but I think in sales now, t I mean, there has been teaming traditionally, there has been some teaming, but now I think teaming has become even more critical because as you say, you can be teaming with people at the client, you can be teaming with consultants that the client is has hired right. you may be teaming with multiple people internally it may be a group sell so the whole concept of teaming in sales i think is becoming more prevalent than ever yeah more more prevalent and and messier at the same yes, time yes messier exactly and and so doing it well is inherently hard and it starts i think with that right mindset you know that mindset which is all of us will be better than any of mm. us um, yeah. And mindset that says, I'm curious, I'm eager, I'm, you know, I'm willing to share, I'm willing to learn. I think the three things that all that human beings need to do well today are kind of, you know, which we've been talking about is teaming. we got to be able to build relationships on the fly, yeah. um, learning, you know, and these, these aren't meant to be mutually exclusive. They're very mm -hmm. interrelated, but learning, we've all got to be comfortable with the fact that as much as we know, there's a lot more we don't know. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, we're always learning and the world is always changing. So we need to always be learning. And then the third thing, which is almost the worst of all, is we have to be comfortable failing because we'll get mm -hmm. it wrong sometimes. And yeah. both, both, you know, together and individually, we'll get it wrong. And we have to just say, OK, what do I learn? What do I learn from that? How do I go forward? Yeah. And I think I mean, I think 100 percent, especially with the pace of, of change and the pace of business and everything today, that the things you're trying that you're inevitably going to fail probably more than you've ever failed because you don't have the time uh, that maybe you had in the past to test everything make sure everything is working fine you have to kind of get out there and as you say you got to be comfortable you got to be comfortable with failing and i think it's a mindset change for salespeople, like you said because in the past you know sales people kind of been reluctant to bring people in because they think "Ooh, if i bring in john is he going to screw up the sale on me now it's got to be i got to bring in the experts as i need them and worse, I'm not going to have to share credit. And the answer yeah. is, yeah, you are, and that's okay, right? <laughs> Nothing really great is accomplished today without um, a team, without collective. Yeah. So how do you go about really um, setting the setting the foundation for a good team and, and the process of putting a team together correctly from the get-go? I, mean, I think uh, part of the answer is, rec is starting with the recognition that this is um, 
difficult, but I don't, I don't mean difficult in an unpleasant yeah. way. I mean difficult in a very human way that, that mm -hmm. many of our taken for granted human instincts get in the way of effective teaming. You know, they get in the way of effective relationships, period. And relationships at work are, aren't meant to be the same as relationships, you know, at, at home, but they have some features in common. So it's, it's sort of start by recognizing that to bridge the gap between you and another person requires you to be vulnerable, you know, requires mm -hmm. you to be open, then you might feel comfortable being. And I don't mean open about personal things. Sure. I mean, open about your, like three things in particular, your goal, your worries, you know, I'm worried that this will be an obstacle or what have you. Mm -hmm. And your skills. I mean, you've got to be open about, well, I think I bring this. And, mm -hmm. and, and, and so there's that, that willingness to be open to share those things also to be very eager to in return, learn those things um, about another person. So it's, it's, what does it take to, to bridge a gap between you and another human being? Um, how can you yourself and help others be more fearless, right? You know, be more willing to uh, speak up with questions you have, with with the ideas you have that might not yet be fully baked, and and I I argue that that happens in a context of psychological safety. You know, an effect mm -hmm. teaming happens in a context of psychological safety. So you have to build the skills of relating, build the skills of creating an environment where we can just, you know, not take ourselves so seriously, but be willing to get it wrong, make a mistake, speak up, um, and so on. Um, and then, and then really the thing we've already talked about a little bit, which is know that when diff when strangers come together to team or people who aren't, you know, absolutely working together, uh, day in and day out, things will go wrong. So be comfortable with that. And it's not that sometimes they go wrong because we just didn't have time to plan every bit. More often they go wrong because we couldn't have planned every bit because we didn't right. have a crystal mm -hmm. ball. We couldn't mm -hmm. see into the future. So we have to be willing to cope in a world where sometimes the only way to get the information you need is through action. Like you have to try it. You have to try it and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't work because yeah. you're in you're in new territory. And I th I think that's an incredibly important point for people to realize that that uh, that there are what's what's that word there are many you know unknown unknowns right i mean basically right. things that you could exactly. yeah the things that you couldn't possibly know in advance and sometimes you have to it's like when you release a product right uh customers are going to use that product in ways that you could never conceive right and they're going it's going to surprise you and sometimes it'll break because they do that yeah. but then you realize oh well i better make the product work for that but but i think that's an incredibly important thing that we have to get comfortable with trying things and knowing that there's no way of us uh, preempting right. this or, or or figuring it out in advance and it might go wrong um you know sometimes things go wrong because you really didn't do your homework that you sure. should have done but more often things go wrong because it's new terrain mm -hmm. and i think now there's so much as i said i mean i think things are changing so rapidly that there's more new terrain you know than ever out there and as I said, the uh, there are so many specializations and that you need uh, when you come to do something that you know you're obviously going to involve a lot more people. But it also means that it's going you're going to have to bring a lot more constituent parts together. That's right. That's right. And 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 the more different experts, the more room there is for <laughs> miscommunication and error. And that's okay too, right? That's just part and parcel. There's also more room for innovation. Um, and creativity. Yeah. Um, so you, something I've seen here is uh, social and cognitive barriers to teaming, and I'm always really yeah. interested in, in in things like that. So what are what are the social and cognitive barriers? Well, social. I mean, social barriers are are the things like I don't know you very well, mm -hmm. and um, I um, you know feel afraid or reluctant uh, to, to you know be vulnerable to be mm -hmm. open and cognitive barriers are the are the, um, the, the the ways in which our different content um, might clash I mean right. you might you know if you're a software engineer you might use the word platform in one way and if I'm a, um, a, um, a physical builder platform right. means Something entirely different, and we don't know 
you know, if we're in the smart city space and trying to build sensors into our building, we don't know that um, we just talk right by each other. Right, right. Yeah, that that's um, that's funny. It's it's very interesting. I think even on the social thing, I, I mean, I've had a few experiences recently, like where working, as I said, with the contractor over Upwork, fantastic. I don't know anything about the guy, really. Yeah. But we had a great, great communication. His work was superb, and I'd highly recommend him to anybody else. But like I said, I know nothing about him. Right. But the work, the work right. we did together was fantastic. Right. Right, so you had good cognitive knowledge. You know, you thought mm -hmm. the quality of the work was good. Yeah. You sized it up. You understood it. You understood mm -hmm. the contribution, but virtually, you know, no social uh, interaction at all. Exactly. Exactly. So I think that's why we have to, you know, where yeah. these par we have to shift these paradigms and realize that you know we're not always going to really know people, and sometimes you know you have to take a leap of faith. In fact, you do. You do, and that's <laughs> risky, right? Leap yeah. of faith. Well, the whole notion of that is I have to take a risk. Exactly. Well, listen, we're bumping up against the end of our time here, Amy. But before we go, I'd like you to tell people a little bit more about yourself and your work and how they can find out more about you. Sure. Terrific. So I'm a professor at Harvard Business School. And there is a, if you go to the harvardbusinessschool.edu website, you can find anything else about my work and other faculty as well. But I've really spent the last 20 odd years studying teaming and teamwork and especially the kinds of environments, interpersonal environments you have to create to make that go well. And so I've got a new book on, you know, I've got the book on teaming that we've been talking about in a new book called The Fearless Organization, where people are teaming and, and taking risks all the time in order to innovate and, uh, and make better organizations. Yeah, and I think it's incredible, incredibly important work because I think, I mean, as I said, teaming has been around for a long time. But I think that the challenges with teaming in this uh, in this new and exciting world that we've all been uh, thrust into. So I think it's very the work you're doing is very timely and probably coming into fashion now. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, yes, Fun. it's a breakthrough idea who's taken twenty five years to break through. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And I had a 20 year overnight success. There you go. Right, right, exactly. <laughs> well, listen, right, thanks. Thank thanks, Amy. My name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine, Pipeline of CRM. See you all for another expert interview really soon. Thank you.